Good morning, everyone. It's 9 a.m. here in New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. This is Yahoo Finance Live, and here is what we're watching this morning. Christmas came early for investors. The Fed's preferred inflation gauge coming in lower than expected on a year-over-year -year basis, signaling a welcome slowdown in price growth. That cooler number fueling optimism around next year's rate cuts. And Nike share is taking a hit in pre-market trading after the retailer lowered its full-year sales outlook on softening demand. Nike also outlining plans to cut nearly $2 billion in costs. When you take a look at some of the reaction that we're seeing rippling through the industry, it's also dragging down shares of Foot Locker and Dick's Sporting Goods. Plus, China gaming stocks tanking after Beijing unveiled new restrictions to the sector. The curbs came as a surprise to both investors and industry members and sparked an $80 billion sell-off. Well, a fresh reading of the Federal Reserve's preferred inflation measure out this morning, personal consumption expenditures or the PCE price index for the month of November, coming in lower than expected. It's the latest sign of cooling inflation. Core PCE, which excludes food and energy, growing 3.2 percent below the street's expectations of 3.3 percent. Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schomberger has the latest on that for us. Jen. Good morning, Shauna. Maybe time for the Fed to start dusting off its shears. As you said, its preferred inflation gauge clocking in lower than expected at 3.2%. Putting that in perspective, we were at three and a half on the same gauge in October and over 4% in the middle of the year back in July. Now, I also want to bring attention to the six month annualized number because that is now below target, 1.9% for the month of November. All of this underscoring that Fed Chair Powell's dovish pivot last week is perhaps a bit more understandable now. The Fed has, as you know, priced in three rate cuts for next year, even as officials have tried to spill cold water on it this week, saying that either they're not talking about rate cuts or it's too soon for them to consider them or too many. But this data underscores that inflation is falling in line or perhaps even faster than what the Federal Reserve expected. Richmond Fed President Tom Barkin told me earlier this week he needs to see more consistency, more conviction in the data, and that if inflation data cools as expected, then the Fed would act appropriately. Well, we are starting to actually get that data. And I also just want to point out there was a data point that may have been swept under the rug yesterday. We got a revision on third quarter core PCE. It's now at the Fed's target, 2%. So 2% for the months of July, August, and September. This coming on top of the 3.2% reading, which will probably get revised down lower as well for the month of November. All of this, as you mentioned, very good news for investors. Christmas coming early. Will it cause and prompt the Fed to cut rates starting in March, as investors expect? The Fed probably wants to see even more conviction and more downward um, trends on this before they would consider that. So perhaps June may be more plausible. But of course, we will watch the data. We will get another read on this in late January. Back right. to you. Thank you so much, Jennifer Schoenberger. Of course, the market's going to be tracking that closely this morning. As of right now, the Dow futures at least down uh, by uh, just a hair here. The S&P 500 futures holding on to some gains. And additionally, the Nasdaq futures in positive territory. Of course, we've got a little bit of time until the opening bell. And with that, we also want to talk about Nike shares falling this morning after announcing a plan to cut $2 billion in costs and announcing that they're wading through a more difficult consumer environment. This all coming during its second quarter earnings call Thursday night. The sneaker giant just missed analyst expectations for revenue, but beat on adjusted earnings per share during the quarter. Diving into this report, we had a few key takeaways, Shauna, and the softness in digital traffic is one that really caught my attention here as the company was talking about it on the call. And we'll run through the other two as well in just a moment. But on that softness in consumer traffic, they mentioned on the call that while Nike store traffic continued to grow, we saw softness in digital traffic and higher levels of promotional activity across the marketplace. Yeah, promotional activity, that was the second thing we also yeah. wanted to talk about. But it all ties together, right? It comes back to the fact that the consumer is weakening a bit. They're being a little bit more hesitant in terms of making those big purchases. We certainly did see that reflected in the digital sales number, a rise of just about 4% compared to what we saw a year ago, which was a jump of 25%. So we got to put that in perspective. What I'm really focusing on, though, is the hunt for deals because this is a theme that we have seen now throughout this earnings season when it comes to these retailers, when it comes to consumer behavior on the earnings call. 
company executives saying that there are indications of a more cautious consumer behavior, not just in the U.S., but what we're seeing around the world. And I bring this up because I also want to show two charts that Goldman Sachs was out yeah. with this morning talking about, and I think it really points to the weakening that we're seeing in the consumer. One of those charts was delinquency rates, how we are starting to see a bit of a rise. We do expect that here to continue to be at elevated levels. You can certainly see it tick up just a bit, and it's projecting out to 2025. The second one is the rise that we are seeing when it comes to rates and higher interest rate payments for credit cards. So you see the commercial banks of credit card interest rates there rising, having that uptick. And I bring this up because that is just illustrates the pressure that so many consumers are under right now. They're not able to meet those credit card payments, the interest that they are being charged. Obviously, just another layer of the complexity and another layer of pressure that people are feeling at this point. Absolutely. And then the last thing in our key takeaways here was really what's set to come in some of the inventory mix shifts here. And what do we mean by that? Well, they're going to lean more into and especially kind of looking across the brands that have performed best for them. You think about the Jordan brand and how they've essentially been able to expand that into everything that is even non-basketball at this point. You've seen it on the soccer pitch. You've seen it on the football field. You've seen it on the golf courses. And so all of that considered, they mentioned their top franchises continue to drive strong full price sales, but intentionally managing the life cycle of these models across the marketplace for long-term value is what's important to the brand. So given the promotional environment and plus the cautious consumer behavior, that you were outlining as well, showing up in that transaction data, they're going to be stepping up plans to reduce marketplace supply of some of their key franchises, and that's where it comes into an inventory management mechanism as well here. Well, while investors are troubled by the impact of macro headwinds on Nike sales, analysts seem encouraged by the company's shift in attention to margins. Our next guest says that while the timing of the cut announcement may be questionable, she likes the goal of funding high growth initiatives. We have Anissa Sherman, who is the Bernstein, senior analyst here with us. Anisha, great to speak with you as always here. You know, a lot of people are waking up this morning, especially after uh, the drudging that shares took immediately after the earnings release was dropped last night, plus the call took place, and trying to figure out in an environment where we've heard all week, buy on the dip, buy on the dip, buy on the dip. You got a 10% dip here in Nike. Is it worth owning when you think about the long-term trajectory? I think yes. Um, so the issues that Nike highlighted in its H2 guidance cut, which was the big driver of the market reaction last night after market, uh, you know, they cut guidance from high single digits down to 1% growth, big, pretty big cut. But the biggest driver of that was ma macro. And we've been hearing about macro weakness across the sector. We heard it from Under Armour, from Lululemon, from Skechers, from Crocs, um, from a bunch of brands, you know, that reported over the last month. Nike hasn't reported since September. So they are kind of catching up to a trend that others in the sector have pointed out. I don't believe it signals any weakness in the Nike brand relative to competitors. It's just weakness in the market overall. Shana, Shana you talked about promotionality, the weakness of digital. Um, we're seeing all of those impacts on Nike's numbers as well as everybody else's. So I would not read this as a fundamental deceleration of Nike in particular. It's just a tough market. And if you're looking at it out, you know, more than six months out, I think this is a good opportunity to get into the stock. And Anisha, as you pointed out uh, in your note here this morning, the margin story is one of the bright spots within this report, just in terms of some of those positive trends that we're seeing there. Management, you say, investing in growth. So when you take a look at where Nike could be a year from now, two years from now, what's going to drive that stock here to the upside and drive those numbers revenue to the upside? It's actually both revenue and margins. I mean, Nike has been a revenue story the last few years, and margins have disappointed. They now have a lot of margin tailwinds coming back, both kind of the, <clears throat> the transitory costs of COVID that are now reversing, like freight, as well as some structural margin improvement in how they run the business. Um, but at the same time, they are investing in top line growth. You know, they keep telling us Nike is a growth company. We haven't seen that this year, but I'm optimistic about seeing them invest into women's, into Jordan, into um, a big innovation cycle, into gaining share and running. Um, these changes will take time, but I think, you know, you, uh, over a medium term time horizon, I think we should see them reaccelerate growth and get back into kind of share gain mode. We were just talking about what the inventory mix shift might look like for Nike. What is perhaps one of the most profound changes that you expect them to ultimately initiate or the lever that you expect them to pull? 
Um, one of the one of the interesting things they commented on as part of this sort of uh, cost cutting or kind of sharpening of the market performance program they're running is they're going to make bigger bets on the stuff that's working. The so women's and Jordan were two big growth opportunities that they highlighted. And the flip side of that is they're going to underinvest in maybe the more basic stuff, the stuff that doesn't move as fast, it doesn't drive as much brand heat. So we are going to see more of a mix shift towards bigger, higher ticket, more brand heat generating um, products in particular franchises that are successful, which I think is all very good for the brand's ability to gain share and stay relevant in people's minds. Anisha, when it comes to some of the trends that we're seeing internationally, specifically some of the slowdown that, we're, that we saw in Europe during the quarter, also uh, more specifically the sluggish sales out of China, what are you seeing? I guess, how does that stack up with your current checks? And when are you expecting, do you see a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to those two markets? It's different between the two. So in Europe, we're seeing order books for H124, so the spring, summer uh, season, coming in really weak. Retailers aren't sure about where demand is going to go. They don't want to get stuck with a ton of inventory. So their pre-order books are very low, which obviously hurts um, the guidance of Nike and other peers as they think about what their sales are going to be to these retailers. Those orders have the opportunity to pick up. I mean, if we see demand exceed expectations, they will order more. But at the starting point, is low and in some cases negative in Europe, which puts a lot of pressure on the brand. In China, it's really a bifurcation between channels, where China online is a very promotional channel and is becoming more and more promotional. And in stores are much more full priced. So Nike's performance was something like up 20 in stores and down 20 in online for China. Huge bifurcation in the market. Anisha, you have a lot of the kind of secondary players or those who are wholesalers uh, and have wholesale contracts with Nike that are catching strays here today in their own stock price movement. Foot Locker's down almost 8%. You've got Dick's Sporting Goods that we've been tracking this morning. All this considered, what would you think on the wholesale side, if you're hearing what Nike just said yesterday and trying to kind of best grapple with where inventory might still actually flow through to you, knowing that this has been a very stringent relationship that Nike has initiated as they've really gone more and leaned more into that direct-to-consumer where they can perhaps hold on to data or just generate a more personal kind of customer interaction? Yeah, I don't think it's particularly new news, but I guess it just emphasizes the points that Dixon, Foot Locker, and others made in their own earnings over the last month, which is it is very promotional out there. Dick Sporting Goods said that they were seeing strong activity in the promotional periods, but big lulls in between. We heard the same thing from Nike last night. So it supports the trends that we've heard from these retailers, but I think, you know, probably is incrementally weak because Nike usually supersedes these trends. And we are now seeing Nike succumb to the same trends that are hitting the market overall. Um, so Nike isn't as defensive in their portfolios as perhaps we thought it might be. All right, Anisha Sherman, always great to get your insight here. Bernstein, a senior analyst. Once again, Nike shares under pressure ahead of the open following of these results. Let's take a look at another mover here this morning. The White House closely watching the $14.1 billion deal from Japan's Nippon Steel to acquire U.S. Steel, saying that it deserves, quote, serious scrutiny. Now, in a statement, National Economic Advisor Lael Brannard saying that, quote, this administration will be ready to look carefully at the findings of any such investigation and to act if appropriate. And, Brad, this is coming ahead of the 2024 election, which I think says a lot just in terms of the scrutiny, the potential regulatory pressure that this deal could face because President Biden, the Biden administration, certainly feeling the pressure from some of these swing states, the battleground states, and in particular, the state of Pennsylvania. Two senators there writing a letter to Janet Yellen saying that this deal should be killed because of the impact that it, that it could have on workers within that state alone. You got to think that this is a, a point that is going to be heavily debated and something that's going to carry over as we look ahead into next year for the first several months of next year. Right. I imagine uh, Treasury Secretary Yellen receives that letter and goes, guys, what do you want me to do? I'm in the Treasury <laughs> at the end of the day. But perhaps there is some sway, major sway that she has within the ear of Biden. And here's what was said within that note from Leo Brainerd as well. This looks like the type of transaction that the Interagency Committee on Foreign Investment, Congress empowered and the Biden administration strengthened is carefully uh, is set up to carefully investigate because ultimately they believe the purchase of the American-owned company U.S. Steel uh, by a foreign entity, even from a close ally, appears to deserve serious scrutiny in terms of the potential impact. And here's what they cited. 
national security, supply chain reliability. So those two major call outs from the administration and uh, this deal is set for anything but just smooth sailing to the finish line. Yeah, certainly. And it's also important to point out that this deal, it would create the second largest steel company here in the world. So we talk about the impact that's going to have on the industry, not only here in the U.S., obviously the fact that it's such a massive global player, the global implications are also in focus. Absolutely. Healthcare also jumping on the acquisition train here. Bristol Myers Squibb has reportedly reached a $14 billion deal to acquire Karuna Therapy. Therapeutics, uh, therapeutics, usually I'm better at that one. According to the Wall Street Journal, the drug maker will pay $330 per share for Karuna, whose experimental drug for schizophrenia is awaiting FDA approval. The deal expected to close in the first half of 2024. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani joins us now with more. Hey, Anjali. Hey guys, yes, that $14 billion deal makes it the second largest this year. Uh, we, of course, know that Pfizer's CGen uh, acquisition was about $43 billion, so that puts it in first place. Uh, this uh, uh, acquisition kind of puts neuroscience on the map. It's the second big deal that we've seen this year, also in that space, at V acquiring uh, Karuna's uh, uh, competitor, Cerevel, uh, which is a little bit earlier in its process, doesn't have an application now. Out for its drug just yet. Meanwhile, Karuna looking to serve a market of about 1.6 million people with schizophrenia, and the drug analysts say could rake in about $6 billion. That drug is waiting for FDA approval by uh, 2024. They're, uh, the FDA is set to have a decision by September of next year. So. Uh, after this deal likely closes in the early part of the year. And this is a good move for Bristol Myers, which has been really under pressure with its patent cliff that, you know, not uh, different from any other large pharmaceutical companies that are also looking to boost their pipeline as they look for loss of patents uh, for a number of their big, big drugs, uh, some of their blockbusters. Bristol Myers is all, also in that category. Uh, a lot of people not liking uh, that uh, deal earlier. Uh, Bristol was a little bit down on the news because they're not liking the fact that it's going to add to the debt for the company. So that's uh, a thing to look at. But right now, it's an interesting time for Euro, lots of reinvestment after more than a almost a dozen years, maybe a little bit more, since large pharma really backed off of this space. And now you can see that interest booming with, of course, that boom in mental health that we saw through the pandemic. So this is really spurring a lot more interest. It certainly is. We're watching uh, the stock reaction. You mentioned some of the pressure that we saw on shares earlier. We'll see whether or not that holds it through the open. All right, Anj, thank you. Well, tech giant Tencent led an $80 billion sell-off across online names in China in response to sweeping new gaming regulations restrictions from Beijing. Now, the new curbs, which caught many investors and industry members by surprise, are reminiscent of China's tech sector crackdown in late 2020, which, as you remember, wiped out more than a trillion dollars off Chinese big tech names. For a closer look at some of the moves that we're seeing this sell-off, Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery standing by at the big board, Jared. This has echoes of 2020, and as you were saying, Shauna, that was when uh, there was a lot of fears that China was going to crack down, and in fact, they did on the tech sphere. Uh, exactly how far this is going to go, we don't know, but the history is long and storied. And you can see, and it's not just Tencent, a lot of these Chinese issues are down considerably. Alibaba down 2%, Pinduoduo down 3%. And if I sort by performance here, some of the worst uh, losers here, Netties, that is down over 20%. We have Billy Billy, that's down 10%. And uh, not all of these, uh, not all of these tickers that are down so much necessarily have that much to do with gaming. But you can see there, Tal Education Group, that is down about 9% in extended hours trading. And let me just go to my gaming heat map. Uh, this covers not only. Uh, the Chinese gaming market, but around the world. And you can see a lot of other issues are down in sympathy here. Um, one of the biggest losers is this stock right here. Uh, this is Naspers, and uh, through its company process, it owns, it owns about 25% of Tencent. This is down 17% in Johannesburg trading. And uh, a lot of these tickers here in the US, some of these actually are OTC tickers. So we're not going to see those pre-market quotes from them. But when they open up, here's Tencent. I'm 
expecting that to be about down about 10-15% here. So there are some considerable losses here. And all of this surrounds uh, these games trying to get users to log in at least once per day. Uh, Chinese authorities don't think that's good for the social health of the company. And uh, here's, here's a statement from the Tencent vice president of games. He's saying the proposed curbs do not fundamentally change business models and operations. Well, that might be the case, but again, we don't know how far this is going to go. And the echoes of 2020 are when Alibaba was a target. Jack Ma was uh, kind of running his mouth at during at the time and saying a bunch of things that upset the party officials um, and they didn't like his capitalist leaning so much. So there is a multi-year prong to rein that in. If you remember the DD, uh, that's a ride hailing app that was uh, that IPO'd, I believe, in 2021. Chinese authorities did not like that it was listed here and they shut that down almost immediately. A lot of uh, negative statements that drove the stock price down and eventually DD relisted in Asia. So um, the reper repercussions from this are gonna be felt not only on the open today, but in the days to come and definitely a situation we're gonna be monitoring, guys. Jared, the only situation I'm monitoring right now is your blazer. My goodness, oh, never you. one to miss a reason oh, to celebrate here, Jared. That. I Valentine's love it, Day love too. the spirit. That, the detailing on that is incredible. It is giving suave <laughs> stocks for certain this morning here. <laughs> Jared, thanks so much for the update. Everyone coming up, we're just minutes away from the opening bell. That's next on Yahoo Finance. Markets are mixed this morning as investors digest the final inflation reading of 2023 PCE. As investors look 
to a potential Santa Claus rally to close out the year. Intention is shifting to 2024. So to tell us more on what she's expecting, we've got Michelle Snyder, MarketGage.com partner and director of trading, research, and education here with us and good friend of the show as well. Michelle, great to see you here. So, so Mish, as we think about what the technicals are telling us going into and perhaps to kick off a potential Santa Claus rally, how strong is the technical case here? Well, how could you argue when we've gotten close to or taken out all-time highs in certain indices and made the spectacular rally that we've seen in small caps now holding at a very key level? So one would have to think, apart from any kind of consequential uh, thing that happens in the world, which of course, you know, we've got these powder kegs all over, that we should at least hold relatively steady into the end of this year and in January, uh, start out well. Of course, the Fed has a lot to do with it, and uh, and today's numbers really support that. So at this point, we're saying that I think the, the real growth for next year will be more in the small caps and in the manufacturing industrials. Obviously, the Dow has been the champion so far the last couple of months. See no reason for that to continue right now. So, Mish, when you're trying to figure out some of those positions or plays that are better positioned than others. You just mentioned some of the names that are at the top of your list. In terms of investment themes, when you're taking a look at some of the technicals and some of the levels here that we are hovering as we start 2024, what's at the top of the list in terms of what you like and why? Well, I have to say gold. I mean, it's sort of it's separate from everything we just talked about, right? The roseate picture. But gold, even this morning before it opens, is is going near all time highs. And to me, it, what it's really telling you right now is regardless of what's happening, gold is a safety blanket that I think everybody needs to have. And even though this year it hasn't had quite the stellar returns that we've seen in so many other areas, I think that could really change as we go into 2024. And that would also mean silver and probably some of the industrial metals. So that might be the, the safest call out, I can say right now. But there are other areas I'm looking at as well. I, what was very interesting to me over the last few months was this sort of you only live once attitude by consumers. Consumers have really helped keep this market up, even though we know that if you look under the surface, there's been a lot of problems with credit card delinquencies and high interest rates, et cetera. They're still out there, even though Nike had the poor earnings. They have actually done what they needed to do to get us to this point. I think we could see a shift in that from, well, let me take care of my family and friends and travel and have fun to let me take care more of myself. So we're looking at skincare, beauty, fashion, uh, maybe some more cosmetic type surgeries. You know, these, these kinds of things that people kind of put on the shelf might come back. So we like certain names like Cody and Elf and Ralph Lauren and, you know, areas like that that will have more personal uh, reflection of people's attitude. Uh, we're going to kind of encapsulate that as the, the calculated YOLO trade, if you will, Mish. Uh, I, I love the way that you put that together and a lot of little luxuries all the way into luxury luxuries in there as well here. What about some of the media stocks? You've been looking at these closely as well. Well, yes, I also think, well, this is a very interesting year we're going into. And, you know, I know this may sound a little bit woo-woo, but I've been a big fan of following the Chinese astrology in terms of what not only the animal representation is, but what the elements are. And we're going into a wood dragon year. So when I do some research, and it's been very accurate. I mean, last year, the rabbit, right? And so essentially we had a market that was very much like a rabbit, in that the rabbit flitted away while the people that were hunting with the hounds kind of were left behind. This year with the dragon and the wood, we've got areas that can really prosper. Obviously fashion is one of the things that comes up, um, but also, you know, in terms of this whole uh, wood thing, the media and people going out and enjoying themselves uh, is another possibility. I think that people have still really held themselves back post COVID and the optimism is going to continue and, and that will extend into media as well. So we're looking at Roku, Spotify, maybe Live Nation, you know, that type of stuff. But how much of this hinges on what what the Fed does. And when, when it comes to what we have seen historically, when we have seen er, uh, time periods of peak inflation or increased inflation, what are some of the lessons that you learned from that in terms of how that then applies to your investment strategy today? 
Well, that's sort of that's such a great question because with everything so optimistic I just said, there's another chart in my head that just keeps sticking. And of course that goes along with the gold price. And that is the overlay from 1966 to 1982 CPI with what's happened over the last 20 some odd years here in the 21st century. And this is following it to a T. We had the peak in 1975 CPI, then it came all the way down to about 2% down in 1977. And then, you know, everybody got complacent and we had a recession, which some people think we are in, some people don't, it doesn't really matter. What matters to me is that if we follow that same graph and we are starting to get close to a trough in terms of CPI, which certainly could be the case right now. It could be because the Fed uh, is a little bit too dovish as we go into 2024. And we start to see those inflation numbers come back up. That could really change a lot of what happens over the course of 2024. So I would not exactly say inflation is dead. I would just say right now it's rhyming with history. All right, and something we are obviously going to continue to watch as we look ahead to the new year. Michelle Schneider, always great to have you here. MarketGage.com partner and director of trading, research, and education. Thanks so much, Mish. Happy holidays. You too. All right, let's get to the opening bell on Wall Street. Jared Blickery standing by for a quick check of the markets. And Jared, as we start the final five trading days of the year, what do you see? Here comes Santa Claus. This is officially the first day of the Santa Claus rally. I'm dressed for the occasion. Uh, this goes through the end of the year, plus the first two trading days of the new year. So that's a couple of days in to the new year in 2024. And we have a mixed market today. Russell 2000 up half a percent, NASDAQ up about a third, and you can see the Dow languishing just a little bit in the red. And I want to check out the bond market real quick. Uh, this is a 10-year T-note yield. It's down another three basis points, very close to a five-month low right there and also got to check out the VIX because the VIX has perked up despite the bullishness lately um, it did pick up a little bit over the last couple days uh, but not in the bond market are we seeing similar volatility we've seen actually uh, the move index coming down so not a lot to worry about that uh, I'm seeing in the market right now and let's take a look at the sector action where we have energy that's up 85 basis points almost nine tenths of a percent followed by real estate healthcare, communication services materials and utilities only consumer discretionary, that's XLY that has Amazon and those retail names, that is in the red right now. And just want to focus real quickly on crude oil because uh, there's been increasing alarm. Uh, ships have been turning around in the Red Sea. And uh, let me see if I can pull up our ticker here. There we go. Crude oil up about 1%. Uh, because of the Iranian situation with the Houthi rebels in Yemen, a key shipping route that involves the Red Sea and the Suez Canal, uh, ships are avoiding it. And so this causes causes disruptions, it increases transportation costs, costs, and in general, geopolitics tends to drive the price of commodities up. Um, this is lean hogs. That's not what I'm looking for right here. Let's get a picture of crude oil. And there we go. This is year to date. And you can see uh, we were down for about 10 weeks in a row, but now we are threatening to break to the upside after coming down and testing, not exactly, but testing these lower levels. So if this gets, gets some momentum to the upside, could easily see $90 crude once again. Uh, moving on, let's take a look at some of the leaders here. And not surprisingly, Chinese stocks, KWeb is down 5%. That has to do with the internet gaming or the crackdown over there on Tencent and other internet gamers that we were talking about. But the number one uh, group here is uh, biotech, 1.83%. Haven't seen that in a while. New York Fang, so the MAG7 doing well. Cannabis, which has been really depressed, can't catch, catch a break recently. And then the disruption trade, that's up 1%. Interestingly, bets, that is uh, the US ETF for gaming, that's up 9 tenths of a percent. So not seeing too much fallout from in that sector there. Uh, finally, just want to take a look at the EV sector. Um, not seeing a whole lot of movement. Tesla up 1%. And it looks like uh, if we could find, let's sort by performance here, because it looks like we got a couple of losers here. Plug is down 2%, and Faraday Futures down, well, 98% year to date, but uh, another few percentage points today. All right, well, the heat maps, not where it's uh, beginning to look a lot like <laughs> Christmas, just where it always does. Should have Jared ended Blickard. differently, but next time. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, Jared, thanks so much. Appreciate it. We also want to get a look at some of the trending tickers this morning. Rocket Lab shares, they are taking off after the aerospace manufacturer entered a $515 million deal here with a U.S. government customer to design.
and operate 18 space vehicles under the contract rocket lab going to deliver its space vehicles to the customer for a launch slated in 2027 and operate satellites through 2023 here uh, they said that work under the agreement is going to begin and and as we mentioned slated for 2027 and then Ultimately here, the incentives, the options, uh, base amount of $489 million is what's kind of encapsulated within that $515 million kind of headline uh, deal price here. Yeah, certainly the street seeing it as a catalyst here for shares in the uh, short term. And also, obviously, it makes sense for a longer term play as well. City is also very encouraged by this, the fact that they did win a $550 million U.S. government contract. City making the argument that this more than doubles the backlog for its space systems business. And we know we were just talking about Rocket Lab last week, the fact that it was able to successfully launch its first electron rocket since the failure that they did see in September. We saw a lot of excitement surrounding that initially. Once again, uh, to end the week, we're seeing some excitement in the shares on the heels of this government contract. Obviously, a huge win here for the company and what it could mean in some of those future deals that could be coming their way. I mean, the government contracts are massive, especially for any of the companies, whether publicly traded or privately held in the space space, if you will. Look no further than SpaceX, which has been able to make sure that its business sees the necessary amount of revenues to be able to operate based on government contracts that it's been able to see. That's ultimately catapulted to a hectacorn type of valuation. Mythical creatures will debate them later on. But at the end of the day, for SpaceX, for Rocket Labs, uh, even for some of the other publicly traded entities such as Lockheed Martin, mm -hmm. they've all consistently had to rely on some of these major government contracts. Rocket Lab uh, catching a bit here from one United States, um, at least division, government customer here. Hectacorn. Hectacorn. Yeah. The whole thing. Yeah. I think. Well, you got your unicorns. You got yeah, your decacorns. Makes sense. It makes sense. Yeah. I guess the next thing is hectacorns. All right. All right. Make a strong argument there. All right. Let's take a look at another mover here this morning. Another stock that we're watching is Occidental Petroleum. Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway upping its stake in the energy giant. Now, according to a Form 4 filing with the SEC, Berkshire Hathaway purchased another 5.2 million dollars worth of shares of Oxy, bringing its total ownership to more than 243 million shares. That equates to about a 28% stake in the company. You're taking a look at a five-day chart, but if you take a look at a longer-term chart, year-to-day chart, one-year chart of Occidental Petroleum, it hasn't done too much. You can see shares off just about 2%. So you might be asking yourself, why then is Warren Buffett doubling down on a name like this? Well, we know some of the pressure. He often sees a buying opportunity when stock prices do pull back. Also, we have to bring to attention the shift that's happening right now within the energy space, something that we have been talking about time and time again, this revival of onshore drilling, the U.S.'s role in the global energy market. And we know that Occidental recently agreeing to buy Crown Rock uh, earlier this month for just about $12 billion, giving them a larger exposure here to the Permian Basin. So clearly they see it as a big driving opportunity, a future driving opportunity for returns down the line. Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, at least, seems to like what they see. So once again, adding to their position within the name. Yeah, you take a look at the stock chart that we were just looking at a moment ago here. And ultimately, they were able to make this purchase uh, just shy of where um, shares are sitting right now. The average price that they paid for the orders that they were able to place and submit here um, that, you know, I won't even go into the totals of how many shares they purchased, but the average price comes out of about 60 bucks. So just a little bit shy of where we're seeing shares trade here on the day. And so ultimately catching a little bit of a deal, but also kind of moving markets with that as they have the propensity to do when you've got that type of money to throw around. Coinbase also going international. What's behind the crypto exchanges push into Europe and what it means for U.S. investors next.
Several pharmaceutical companies have pulled their patents from the FDA's database after the agency's recent crackdown. Let's bring in Anjali Kamlani, Yahoo Finance's re health reporter, to discuss what this means for those companies and consumers. Hey, Anjali. Absolutely. Hey, Brad. So we know that the FTC has been really locking into a lot of what pharma does, sort of minor deals and ways that they extend their patents or look at ways to block generics from coming on the market. Now, this is what is at the crux of the move. The FTC just a couple months ago, letting uh, companies know, sending out a letter to a, about a dozen companies, letting them know that they were targets for possibly properly listing their patents in the FDA's orange book. And so this is the first uh, sort of big win in that space for the FTC with three companies now delisting those patents, largely for EpiPens and inhalers. GSK, for example, letting go of four of its patents, uh, delisting those from that book. And uh, it really speaks to what we've seen the FTC kind of signal, which is that these uh, practices from the industry are helping to keep costs high. And we heard uh, FTC Chair Lena Khan really talk about that earlier this year, saying, quote, we've seen a whole set of deals that are below our radar, that are kind of slowly and incrementally consolidating a market. That was in reference to smaller deals, M&A activity. But this is also part of the equation. You know, companies can use this strategy to sort of extend the profits that they receive by about 30 months in general uh, whenever a patent is listed in that orange book. So this really speeds up when generics can come to market and may also help spur more focus on certain areas where they feel, uh, you know, smaller companies especially feel that may be blocked by these moves. So mm. really interesting move for the FTC there. Very interesting. All right, Anj, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. We also want to turn to the latest within the crypto market because Coinbase getting regulatory approval this week in France, pushing deeper into the European market. Now, the news coming amid excitement surrounding crypto assets. We have certainly seen a rally in Bitcoin prices in just the last month alone. They're looking at gains of about 16 percent. A lot of this excitement due to a potential approval of a Bitcoin spot ETF, the first one that could be coming to market here in 2024. We want to bring in John Todaro. He is Needham & Company's senior analyst. John, it's great to have you here. Let's first start with the news that we got out this week of Coinbase, because when you take a look at that chart, we're looking at gains here at the open. We're looking at pretty significant gains over the last week alone. Over the last five days, the stock up just about 17 and a half percent. How big of a milestone is this for Coinbase's international growth strategy? Sure. I think it's a strategy that they almost had to do with the, the lack of regulatory <laughs> clarity in the U.S. We saw Robinhood do a similar push where they opened up in Europe. They offer more crypto assets there for trading than in the U.S. So it certainly makes sense for Coinbase to do that push. I would say a, a big part of the stock move, though, has just been the underlying performance of crypto assets, the expectation of a Bitcoin ETF coming down, because um, the, the, the miners are up quite a bit as well this past week. So it's not a you know just related to Coinbase and their international push, um, but this does open up new growth strategies for them. And they do plan to push more internationally in 2024 and beyond, uh, especially until we get a little bit more regulatory clarity here in the States. John, you got some calls out this morning comparing Coinbase to perhaps the, the Amazon of crypto. You know, at the end of the day, what, what is going to be the driving force that has consumers look at this company and say ultimately that this is something that I need to have on my phone, that is so kind of integral in crypto to their everyday lives that Coinbase sits at perhaps the hub of that? Yeah, I think the key to that is crypto be, or Coinbase becoming more than just a crypto exchange brokerage. So what it needs to do is um, become, to, to your point, uh, have a lot more use cases within crypto besides just trading. And one way they can do that is their own blockchain. They have a, a base chain is their own blockchain, which they've launched. That could become very integral to a lot of aspects of the crypto ecosystem. I mean, it could underpin uh, gaming applications, underpin uh, other trading products. So there's a lot of things that they can do with that. And that's where users might even be transacting on one of the Coinbase blockchain and not even know it. So in that case, Coinbase could become this hub uh, for a lot of activity within crypto, less so just kind of, hey, here's this retail platform to go buy and sell Bitcoin on. 
John, when it comes to how investors, how advisors are thinking about Bitcoin or thinking about crypto, you recently did a survey. You spoke with advisors, individual investors, just trying to determine or gauge, I guess, a perception of a potential uh, spot Bitcoin ETF, whether or not that approval is going to really uh, be a catalyst here for the price movement that we could see in crypto. What did you find? Yeah, so one, right now, there's a lot of disinterest still in Bitcoin and a Bitcoin ETF. We found that only 11% of individuals who haven't bought Bitcoin in the past said they would be likely or very likely to buy into a Bitcoin ETF. Um, so we do think right now it's still pretty early innings, even though there's been a lot of talk about a Bitcoin ETF. Your average investor, they're not sitting there ready to go the moment a Bitcoin ETF is launched. Um, so one, the big takeaway from that is we do think it's early innings. We think if Bitcoin gets above 50K or higher, that starts to get the excitement back in the space. Then you have this Bitcoin ETF product and capital might flow in. And then the second point is that the advisors is where we think the capital will mostly come in. You might have some individuals get excited about it. But keep in mind, there's a lot of avenues that exist today for individuals to buy Bitcoin. They can go to Coinbase, they can go to Robinhood, they can go to decentralized exchanges. So there's a lot of avenues for those folks where we think the new capital would come in from advisors. Um, and so the survey did find a little bit more positive aspects about advisors getting capital allocated to uh, Bitcoin ETF. But even that, we found that advisors mostly have had disinterest from their clients so far. John. We've been trying to get a roundup of how big of a deal this having that's anticipated for next year is. From your perspective, coming off of the crypto ice age, the crypto winter, and, and the washout of some of the more kind of speculative parts that have been annexed to the crypto market more broadly, algorithmic stable coins, we're looking at you. Is this having the next big deal for or inflection point for crypto? So historically, it has been every four years, you do have this supply demand dynamic where supply, the new supply effectively gets cut in half. So if your demand stays the same, prices should theoretically go up. Um, but I, I would say, you know, a key point to look at is minor break evens. Interestingly, during the halving, prices have risen to put miners just above their break even cost to mine a Bitcoin. And so what we have that pegged at right now for most public miners it's around 40, 43K after the halving because their break even costs effectively double. So Bitcoin's right around at it now. So I would say part of it is that the halving is, is getting priced in a little bit already. It's a tough dynamic now where you go, well, how much is the halving priced in versus how much the Bitcoin ETF is priced in? Both should be the ones driving uh, Bitcoin prices higher. So it could go quite a bit higher because maybe the halving hasn't been priced in, but the Bitcoin ETF has. Um, but regardless, usually prices rise where miners have a little bit of a cushion at the halving. And I would say miners have a cushion right now. So miners are, are sitting okay. They're going to be sitting pretty uh, after the halving. Um, and so, you know, you know, you know, maybe you get a, a bigger push here, but keep in mind that Bitcoin is already, what, two, three X on the year. John, why do you think so many investors are still very skeptical when it comes to investing in crypto? Because what you found in this survey I thought was very interesting because I would I would have guessed that an ETF, you're investing in that's a little bit safer, obviously, than going directly in and investing directly at the rune exchange into Bitcoin. What do you think is keeping some investors on the sideline and what needs to happen in order to have a bigger catalyst here for prices? Yeah, I would say I don't think the ETF is actually safer. I mean, if you look at most of the ETFs, Coinbase is the custodian. So if you go buy Bitcoin on Coinbase, you're going to have the same custodial risks whether you buy the Bitcoin ETF. I do think your expenses get a bit better. So if you're trading uh, in and out of Bitcoin on cryptocurrency exchanges, in some cases you can pay quite a bit, 1%, 2%. If you're buying a, a Bitcoin ETF, you're just holding it, the expense ratio is going to be a little bit lower. And if you trade in and out, equity brokerage pl platforms typically have lower fee than crypto exchanges. Um, so I think from an expense standpoint, it certainly makes sense for a lot of folks to trade it. I think from a custodian risk standpoint, it's going to be pretty much the same. Um, the, the point of what kind of gets things going here, I do think, you know, what our survey found was there's not necessarily capital lined up that the moment a Bitcoin ETF is launched, it's plowing in. Um, I do think you still need either more activity in the ecosystem, um, more use cases, more narratives. So maybe gaming comes about, gets things going. The Bitcoin blockchain is now being used for other things like ordinals, which have gotten a lot of attention lately. 
Um, and then I think you also need Bitcoin, the price, just to get past some certain psychological levels that a lot of retail investors are looking at. So 50K is what we think that is. If Bitcoin gets to there, it keeps pushing higher, then you get an ETF launch. I think some of those folks start asking their advisors, hey, let's take another look at Bitcoin. Um, it's starting to be interesting. Maybe I like it as an inflation hedge. Um, if you see interest rates getting cut, typically that's good for crypto as well. And then as we just discussed, the dynamics around the halving, there will likely be a lot more activity around the halving and investors will start paying a little bit more attention to Bitcoin. John Tadaro, who is Needham and Company Senior Analyst. Thanks so much, John, for taking the time here this morning. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks. Coming up, everyone, markets on track to end the year with a bang. But where is that momentum headed in 2024? We'll discuss next. With the holidays around the corner, it's that time of year to break down the Santa Claus Rally. Despite the folksy name, the Santa Claus Rally is a powerful indicator that can actually help predict whether the new year will end in the red or the green. The term was coined by Yale Hirsch, writing for the Stock Traders Almanac, way back in 1972. It's worth remembering what happens in January because the Santa Claus rally that we talk about, that's actually the, the last five days of December and the first two trading days of January. Hirsch discovered that this stretch of time over the sleepy holidays tends to be overwhelmingly positive for stocks. And over the last three decades, those seven days have been green nearly 80% of the time with an average gain of 1.3% in the S&P 500. Why do stocks tend to drift higher over the holidays? Well, it's bonus time in corporate America, and in general, the seasonal gift giving lends itself to the bulls. Markets tend to be illiquid as traders abandon their desks, and the drumbeat of news quiets. No earnings, no econ reports, even Fed officials quiet down to leave the markets in peace. But it's not just the juicy, reliable returns that attract investors' attention. The Santa Claus Rally is a powerful indicator which, when combined with two other January-based indicators, can reliably predict returns for the remaining 11 months of the year. And then we have something called the January effect and the fi first five days of trading. Suffice to say that January is a very important bellwether for the entire year. Indeed, if you dial back to January of this year, it was overwhelmingly positive. 
But 2022 was such a disaster for investors that it was easy to write off the burgeoning bull market. It's important to remember that the tremendous 2023 rally got its start early on only 12 months ago with those fateful seven days when stocks jumped 2.4%. What's in the cards this year? Let's leave it to the words of Yale Hirsch writing five decades ago. If Santa Claus should fail to call, bears may come to broad and wall. Here's hoping for a green finish to the year and to kick off another bull run in 2024. Markets are rallying to end the week and the year on a high note. As investors shift their focus to 2024, can they expect the bull run to continue? Well, our next guest says yes, but to anticipate a slowdown in momentum, we've got Jay Woods, Freedom Capital Markets Chief Global Strategist, to tell us more. Jay, good to see you here in studio with us, and uh, happy holidays to you as well. You think about whether or not this bull run can continue into 2024, what would be the leading catalyst that investors would need to see? Well, we are on a nice little momentum run. I mean, it's hyperbolic, but I do think it can continue. Uh, what continues? Well, you have the Fed tailwind now. Uh, you know, I don't know how many times they're going to cut rates. I hope it's not too much because that would be a little fearful. Why we did we make a mistake? But um, I love the setups. And then when you, you back it out and you think where we were just two years ago, the S&P 500 still hasn't eclipsed the Jan January 4th, 2022 high. We've almost made that full roundabout. But as a technician, the setups that I see, uh, they're phenomenal. We, we saw the leaders and we can talk about NVIDIA, Microsoft, Apple, Meta, but now you're seeing other stocks start to break out and the trends have been phenomenal and then the bases that we can break from. I really like how we're looking. Jay, we certainly are seeing and broadening out here in terms of the breadth. But when it comes to some of those leaders this year, he mentioned some of those magnificent seven plays. How does that setup look like going into 2024? Yeah, I still like a lot of the stocks in the magnificent seven. I think NVIDIA, you break above 500, close above there. It's got room to run. Is it going to go up to 150%? That's an insane call to make. <laughs> but NVIDIA historically has had 50% rallies on top of 50% rallies. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be surprising to see NVIDIA go up another other hundred points. Um, but the ones I like are the Apple, uh, the Amazons and the Googles that finally made that full roundabout and are now just breaking out. Amazon above 145 looks great. The old high is 185. So these are realistic targets from a technical point of view. And then fundamentally, the economy has been strong. Look at industrials, materials, and now financials coming back. It's going to be, and I, I hate this cliche, a stock picker's market, mm -hmm. but the leaders of these sectors are really starting to look good. You know, when we think about some of the YOLO trade that could reemerge if you see cutting start to commence, mm -hmm. that typically uh, will prevail and, 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 well, not prevail, but that typically will lead to some of the riskier plays within the market as well. And we had a guest on earlier that was talking to us about some of perhaps the, the cautious yet calculated YOLO plays. What are those from your perspective? Well, uh, you know, th those are always risky. When, when you get a momentum like we're seeing now, the tide does tend to lift all boats, and some of these old beaten down names will catch bids. Uh, we, we've seen it with the meme craze. The, the thing that I do like are some of these beaten down IPOs from a year ago, two years ago, like a firm. Coinbase, they're starting to come back. Watch a SoFi. Um, they are real companies and they have good balance sheets now we're starting to see them pick up uh and so i look for that and then speaking of ipos we had five solid IPOs, um, and they're starting to trend towards their you know, year-end highs, that's good momentum. And now the IPO market itself should pick up. If people are waiting for conditions to get better, what's better than all-time new highs and a Fed easing? So look for a lot of interesting companies, and the one I really want to watch, Kim Kardashian, Skims. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's a $4 billion company. She does no wrong in the business world. Imagine the hype and the euphoria from the retail investor if they see her ringing that New York stock exchange opening bell and getting a chance to, to invest in her. And then you have companies like Shein uh, that, you know, have announced Panera coming back. And then everyone's hoping Stripe and a Databricks mm -hmm. come to market. I think the conditions are there. And given the low bar the last two years in the IPO market, it, it should be cleared. 
It certainly, it's incredible to uh, think about all the consumer-facing names that could yeah. be going public in the first half of next year. Jay, the number four point on that full screen that we just had on the screen was what you're seeing in terms of the opportunity with housing. We certainly have seen a rally here in a number of the home builder stocks. What does that setup look like in 2024? Yeah, the, the home builders are another sector that have kind of gone full circle. And if you told me in the beginning of this year, when everyone was calling for a recession, that the, the mortgage rates would go to 8%, and the housing markets would be at all-time highs, I think you're crazy. But now there's a recency bias. There's a built-in bias. People that have been waiting and complaining that rates have gone up so far so fast, when they were at 8%, they, they threw in the towel, and you, you saw just things fall apart. And that happened August uh, through uh, the beginning of November. Now we're making 52-week highs in the sector itself, and it should cool off. Mortgage rates 7% lower and trending lower. People will go out and they'll forget that they were complaining about it a year ago and that recency bias will kick in because now it's on sale. So I think the housing market, the demand is still there with mortgage rates coming in. Uh, I think it's a sector that will have legs going forward into the new year. Just lastly, we want to take a look at that final bullet that you are looking at going into 2024 and it's trends. Follow trends, not headlines. I mean, look, this is a uh, buy the rumor, sell the news type of market. I mean, that's the old adage. At yeah, least. well, 2024 is an election year. Um, and as you know, covering 2016, 2020, the rhetoric can get heated. The conversations around the rhetoric uh, at the dinner table or anything, but you know, civil at times, uh, you got to block out the noise. I always say put on earmuffs when you're listening to the political headlines because what we saw at the end of 2016, it's a controversial election, market rally. 2020, controversial election, market rallied. Presidential cycles, we tend to do well at the end of the year. I suspect we'll do well to kick off this year. I like the Russell still above 2,000. 20 percent below its all-time highs, 13 percent below its 2022 highs. So we have room to go. And uh, yeah, and it's just when we get that presidential cycle, follow your trend lines, not your headlines, and I think we'll be okay. Tune out the noise. Some advice that I think everyone can use at this point. All right, Jay Woods, always great to have you. Thanks so much for joining Thanks. us here. Freedom Merry Capital Christmas. Markets yeah. Chief Global Strategist. Merry Christmas to you as well. All right, well, on the other side of the break, what new home sales data is going to tell us about the long beleaguered sector that we have for housing and how this sets us up for the new year? More on that when we come back.
Welcome back, everyone. You're watching Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith live in New York City, and we're about 30 minutes into the trading day. Let's take a look at how things are shaping up right now. The Santa Claus rally is coming to town. All three major indexes higher as the Fed's favorite inflation gauge. Core PCE shows prices continue to cool in November. And taking a look at some of those individual names, Coinbase having a pretty good couple of days. JMP Securities in a note this morning calling Coinbase the Amazon of crypto and nearly doubling its price target on the stock. Now, this comes a day after the company got the green light to operate in France. And Carnival stock got some wind in its sales this morning. Did they still use sales on those? <laughs> after getting an upgrade from CFRA, boosted to buy from hold on better than expected earnings, the positive sentiment pushing the stock up to a 52-week high. And Lionsgate Class B shares surging on news that the company is planning to launch Lionsgate Studios as a separately publicly traded company here, spinning it off from the Stars TV network and streaming division. Now, the deal is with Screaming Eagle Acquisition Corp and values the studio business at $4.6 billion. It is expected to close in the spring of next year. We got some breaking news here on new home sales data, and we take a look at the numbers. It plunged pretty uh, significantly here in the month of November. A bit of a surprise here, falling by 12.2 percent to an annual rate of 590,000. When you take a look at the drop that we are seeing within this print, some areas of weakness are the south, and this obviously pointing to what looks to be a very bumpy and volatile a road to recovery within the housing market. Brad, we have seen some improvement when it comes to. The 30-year mortgage rate, we know obviously the higher rates keeping many of these potential home buyers on the sidelines. So maybe that number could potentially improve as you look ahead to 2024, but not a massive surprise that we are seeing more pressure within the space given the fact that so many people are holding off on buying those homes and there's just the lack of supply, even from the new homes. Yeah, spot on. You mentioned supply. I want to hit that number first real quick. Seasonally adjusted estimate of new houses for sale at the end of November, 451,000, representing a supply of about 9.2 months at the current sales rate. So that's one figure. The second figure, the median sales price that you're seeing of new houses sold during November 2023, $434,700. Average sales price at about $488,900. So as we continue to really wrap our minds around what it's going to take to move through that inventory that would essentially take, as we mentioned a moment ago, 9.2 months to get through, it's really going to be on the backs of figuring out what is going to be attractive at a rate perspective mm -hmm. for some of the first-time home buyers, which we've continued to hear. We've had discussions even with the National Association of Realtors, Chief Economist Lawrence Yoon this week, and it really comes back to where we're seeing more of them be able to trickle into the market. Yeah, exactly. We know a lot of these home builders are offering various incentives, whether or not it's price cuts, whether or not it's subsidized mortgages, trying to do everything they can to make some of these homes more affordable to those first-time home buyers, because we know just in terms of the impact that this has had on potential home buyers, first-time home buyers, really feeling a large chunk of that pain. Absolutely. Well, we've got the latest few key pieces of data for the year today. Now, consumer sentiment, one of them, rising in December over 13% to 69.7. That's a sign that consumers were optimistic during the holiday season. This comes after the Fed's favorite inflation gauge. Core PCE showed prices cooling even more than expected in November. Joining us now, we've got Lakshman Achuthan, who is the Economic Cycle Research Institute co-founder. Great to have you here, as always. Good we, to be here. We've got kind of two economic readings here on the day that give us a little bit more insight into how the consumer feels. Plus, we got some earnings data that gives us even more of a sure. color here on, on this situation here. What would you say is the kind of broad stroke state of the consumer at this point, given the readings that we've gotten? Okay, so consumer, we're talking economy, that's softening. Uh, and you're seeing, um, I mean, there's always, uh, you could always point to one thing going up or down, but I think the general picture is, is one of softening, and, and it's a reaction to the higher prices that we saw, we've seen, right? So the rate of inflation is coming down, but it doesn't mean the price levels right. have come down, right? They mm -hmm. went up and they're just not rising as fast, they're rising slower. And so that's what the consumer is really struggling with. And you'll see that at the, when you talk about a big ticket, rate sensitive thing like uh, a house or a car, and uh, even in more discretionary things. So something you, you like doing, but you don't have to do, you might get a little edgy around that. Um, and, and maybe that flows through to something as literal as uh, uh, athletic apparel, mm -hmm. you know, like you're seeing, for example, you're seeing some of that stuff. Um, non-discretionary stuff, 
that's solid, right? So education, healthcare, government, those kind of things, they're really plugging along. And in, in some cases, uh, you know, if the government really gives it a boost, like uh, building factories or something uh, right. for specific things, then boy, it's just a boom. Mm -hmm. Or defense spending in, the, in that now too. So what do you think this tells us just about in terms of the expectations for potential rate cuts? If we oh, do yeah. see a continued improvement on inflation, if we do see the Fed uh, progress with their efforts to tame inflation, the market though is very aggressive with what they're pricing in, how quickly they see the Fed potentially cutting rates. Okay, so what do you think is realistic? Yeah, so, so we're switching gears yeah. from consumers, like are we taking mm -hmm. money out of our pockets and doing things? And what's the Fed up to? And what is the market guessing about, mm -hmm. right? So the Fed, uh, I think for more than a week now, it's been mission accomplished. I mean, in fact, it almost seems like uh, uh, Chair Powell might have had a peak mm -hmm. <laughs> at the BCE <laughs> uh, core, the numbers coming, coming down, mm -hmm. right? And um, so there, uh, you know, he's saying, hey, maybe I'll do three cuts next uh, year. The market's saying, sure, we heard six. Yeah. <laughs> and really running with it, mm -hmm. saying mission accomplished. The, the issue is that both the Fed and I think the market, they like to extrapolate these things. So they're looking at the charts mm -hmm. and this inflation, rate of inflation is coming down. So they say, hey, it's gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. um, but, but if you step back and look at how inflation acts, it actually cycles up and down. And so, um, if there's a turn out there somewhere next year, that may not play along with the current narrative. Mm -hmm. And so I think right now, inflation coming down, Fed easy, market getting excited, hopeful that rate cuts will support the weak housing that we've seen in the, in the rear view mirror. Right. That's the hope, right? Now we have to just see if inflation really follows through next year and, and continues to ease. What do you believe the probability is that we could see another spike in inflation then next year? And what would be the catalyst for that? Well, I mean, you could look inside the data right now and see wages are holding up. Uh, and they came off, I'm, I'm, these are rough numbers, they were like a 6% something in the Atlanta wage tracker, now they're a 5% something. You see unions have quite a bit more power, there's wage uh, uh, increases coming through in, in lots of new contracts. And particularly in the service sector, they're sticky. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that could be one area. The other thing is when you're, we've done a lot of onshoring, mm -hmm. all that supply chain grief after post-COVID. So you've done some onshoring, security reasons, you might do some onshoring. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of uh, debt being issued. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, there's more demand to, for, 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 for borrowing money. So all of these things could support uh, inflation in the coming year or put a base under it where we may not get to the quite the lows that we were used to before. Mm -hmm. And from a big picture policy maker point of view, that's something you want to think about. Right. You, you, you don't want higher lows in the inflation cycle. So then what do you think this tells us, wrapping this all together, when you take into account the fact that the consumer has remained so resilient, the fact that the jobs market is strong, mm -hmm. the fact that we could see the Fed maybe eventually cut rates at some yeah. point yeah, let's next say year. They do. Let's say they do. Are we going to see a soft landing? Well, um, let's go back to the businesses. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to Nike, for example, just to pick on them. I, I don't have anything against Nike, uh, but, Brad's but they're one saying of their biggest supporters. But they're but they're, but they're saying, know, look, we're, customer out here. I think you're going to hear like, oh, I, you know, promotional, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's they're trying to keep prices down. Their margins are getting squeezed. They're going to talk about cost cutting. I think that was a big part of what they were saying. We're going to lower our cost mm -hmm. structure next year, um, whatever that means. Now that may mean letting people go. Uh, so far, businesses have not been firing. They've slowed down on hiring, but they haven't fired because the labor supply, like the housing supply in a way, is really tight. There's a, a lot of people left the workforce post-COVID for a whole bunch of reasons. And so um, you're, you're, you're hesitant to, to let people go. If we start seeing job losses, I think that's a, a risk factor. That's something to watch for. Some of the bigger companies have let people go already. Um, and we'll see what happens with the medium and smaller companies. And then just lastly, while we yeah. have you here, I mean, you, you game out what it's going to take for the Fed. And, and if they were to cut earlier, that would mean yeah. that they see something so dire that they need to initiate. Yeah. It's kind of like careful what you wish for right. uh, uh, with, the, with, with this, because um, uh, we can hope for the so-called immaculate disinflation. Mm -hmm. But very often, uh, sharp, sharp drops in, in prices is because demand has gone away. Right. Uh, and we will see 
what happens with businesses. Do they have too much inventory? Where in the pipeline? Maybe the frontline retailers are a little tight on, on inventory, but the mid middle of the supply chain has a lot. We have to see how that stuff is working through the system. Um, ultimately, the cure for high prices is high prices, and, and we'll see how that plays out here. You certainly will. And we're never going to have you back very soon yeah, to talk a little bit more year. about the latest data as well. Lakshman, always great to have you. Thanks so much for joining us here in you studio. Too. Happy holidays. Thank you. All right, let's take a look at the IPO market because 2023 laid maybe the early groundwork for an IPO market comeback. We did see some splashy offerings when you take a look at ARM, Kava, and Birkenstock. But overall, their public debuts really failed to spark much excitement about the public market. So will 2024 be different? We want to bring Yahoo Finance reporter Brooke De Palma. And Brooke, we can take a look at so many of these consumer-facing names that we are expected to see go public in 2024. What are the ones that people should really keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, she and Skims, Panera Brands making a return to the public market are some of the ones that really have Wall Street buzzing right now. And when you think about the past year, it was really a rebuild after we saw a slowdown in 2022. We saw that boom back in 2021. And now many looking forward to 2024, thinking that'll be a more robust IPO market come next year. But what's important to note here is that when you think about about Shein, they're really a low cost, uh, you know, not really a luxury brand. So many focusing that if a consumer pullback happens, that Shein will still make that IPO debut. Skims, although on the pricier side, also, you know, not a super high luxury focused brand. So many keeping an eye on that. And of course, Panera Brands also has to do with consumer spending. So many focused on if consumer spending remains strong, then we will see these come to market perhaps early earlier than anticipated. But many factors playing into this, guys. I mean, the Fed's next move is the big question for investors right now. So really, all these companies approaching more of a wait and see type approach to the IPO market before going full steam ahead, interest rates, inflation, and many thinking that the second half of 2024 will be more robust. What do you think the biggest lesson learned is from, from 2023 IPOs? I have, I have my own personal opinions. But <laughs> what did you learn, what, what, what in the market, what, is, what have we learned from these 2023? three IPOs that actually made their way out there only for some of them to see volatility, for yeah. others to question what if we had waited until more of a cutting environment was to proceed in 2024. Yeah, well, early part of 2023, it's sort of they adhere to that wait and see approach. We saw many, you know, make their public debut in the latter part of 2023. But when you think about Kava, when you think about Instacart, uh, Birkenstock, Kava, well, they soared in their IPO debut. You also had uh, Birkenstock. They traded below their IPO debut. And Instacart, well, their valuation got a huge hair haircut from what it was supposed to be back in 2021. So investors are going into 2024 very choiceful, very discerning, and really keeping a close eye on these valuations. They're very sensitive to what they saw with this 2023 IPO class. And of course, Kava now trading back to that IPO price around $42 a share. Then you have Birkenstock now back to the IPO price after falling post-IPO. And Instacart still struggling to really uh, get ahead. They're now trading below their IPO price still. So lots of momentum going into 2024, but many thinking that'll be a bit more sensitive market than perhaps all the excitement that we had back, especially in 2021. All right, all right, get the Funfetti ready. <laughs> Yahoo Finance's own Brooke Palma. So. I know, right? <laughs> Thanks so much, appreciate it. Everyone coming up, new year, new presidential election. How should you play politics? in your portfolio. We've got you covered with our 2024 Investor Guide after the break.
The 2024 presidential election, less than a year away, but some investors fear the race could create more market instability. Given the backdrop of economic concerns, particularly fears of a recession, it raises the question of how stocks typically perform during an election year and whether 2024 will be different. Our very own Jared Blickery has the breakdown for us as part of Yahoo Finance's 2024 Investor Guide. Hey, Jared. Thank you, Brad. Let's take a look at what usually happens with stocks. And this goes back 95 years, almost a century of price data here. And the big takeaway is stocks go up. Uh, you can see it's from the lower left to the upper right. Not always smooth sailing around the September, October period. That's where we have historically a lot of crashes. And that brings down the average. But as you were saying, Brad, we want to see what happens in presidential terms. And this is an election year. And what I've done here, uh, that that previous chart went back to 1928. This goes back to 1949. So it is a post-World War II era. And then I have all year, all years, their averages broken down month by month, what the S&P 500 does. And then in the cyan color, I have the presidential cycle. This is year four of the president, president cycle. Uh, so that represents that. And then in yellow, I have uh, further uh, I guess attain some granularity here by uh, sorting the Democratic presidents uh, four year in their cycle. So if you take a look, what jumps out to me is that February is a negative month, no matter how you slice and dice it here, uh, looking at some average negative, uh, average negative returns there. But in January, you can see for all years, well, we tend to average about 1%. But in the fourth year of the presidential cycle, and especially when there's a Democrat, uh, we don't have as many gains. Then we have March and April. And for all of these things of sell in May and go away, we really don't see that much pressure, although the averages are pretty low. And then we have some strong summer months, June, July, August. And this is where we start getting into the primetime crash season. This is when the VIX kind of explodes uh, some years because we do have the market crashes, Black October being uh, one that happened in 1987. Uh, but in September, we do have average losses for both the overall market since 1949 and the fourth year of the presidential cycle. But when you filter by Democrats only, interestingly enough, uh, September ends up positive. Now, we don't have a huge sample size here, so take that with a grain of salt. But I did think that was interesting. When it comes to October, the average uh, is positive. But then when you get to the presidential cycle, still it's skewing negative to very small gains. But then what sticks out here, guess what? November, usually the best month of the year. And we've seen that in play this year. Uh, but also in the presidential cycle, those election years tend to be even better. And if you take a look at the fourth year of the presidential cycle with a Democrat in office, those are the best gains on average by far. And a couple of notes here, uh, we've had some pretty big changes in the stock market when there have been changes in office. And two of those in the fourth year were when Ronald Reagan came to office, that was a 10% increase in prices in the month of November alone. And then also uh, when, what, excuse me here, when uh, William Clinton came into office. So some of the worst performers here are when George W. Bush came to office and also Barack Obama. But I would say with a grain of salt, you got to take that because the global financial crisis was fully in swing. Um, and then just another note based on that, because we often ascribe a lot of uh, performance in the stock market to what the president is doing. And that was kind of a, a thing that President Trump made a feature of his, uh, of his office and his campaigns. But that is not always the case. And in fact, the president probably has a lot less influence on the economy than a lot of people think. Um, I've been showing what happens with the stock market on average, and I want to show what happens with the VIX on average. And this goes back to the beginning of the, of the VIX, uh, 1990. And in Cyan, we have what happens. And this is going to be a map for the new year as well, because this is an average. And in purple, this is what actually transpired this year. And I'm just putting this overlay to show you how well seasonality really worked this year. A lot of these peaks and valleys, they match up, not necessarily exactly in the right time, but you can see there's a lot of synergy between these uh, movements here. So the bottom line is we do tend to get a drop in volatility at the end of the year, which is what we're expecting. And then we pick up back in January. Final note on volatility, because the VIX has been trending and holding under 15 uh, for a number of weeks, I thought I'd show a longer term view of the VIX. Uh, this is actually the S&P 500. And in cyan dots, I have colored when the VIX is lower. And this goes all the way back to the 1980s. 
Um, and you'll find that these periods of the low VIX tend to be secular bull markets in stocks. So we had this period in the mid-90s. We had this period in the 2000s in the run-up to the global financial crisis. We had the post-GFC era, and there are a couple different segments in there when we had a VIX under 15. And then at the very hard right edge, we have it again. So thinking about the new year, yes, we can have some hiccups with the election, uh, but as we've seen, the averages for all years tend to end positive in December. What happens with this year is going to be decided not only with the Santa Claus rally today, and I know we're thinking far ahead, but as they say, well, the way January goes, it tends to go the entire year. So if we have a positive January overall, uh, probably looking at end of year gains in December. All right, Jared, thanks so much. And I got to say, I'm very impressed that you accurately and specifically were calling that number cyan a few times. I think a lot Thank of people would have just said light blue. Very 100%. impressive, Jared. I was ready to back or uh, Jared on the organ or something from over here. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'd take that. I was <laughs> preaching drawing. over there. All right, Jared, thanks so much. We want to stick with the 2024 presidential election. The race looking tight. Early po polls showing that we could see, though, a rematch between President Joe Biden and former President Donald Trump. Now, here with a look at what this election means for investors in the three biggest issues to keep in mind, we want to bring in Rick Newman. He is joining us now as part of our Yahoo Finance's 2024 Investor Guide. Hey there, Rick. So lots to get into here three big issues that investors need to keep in mind. Your first one is in regards to the Trump tax cuts. Talk to us just about the significance of this and the impact that it could have on investors. So that there are two components to the Trump tax cuts from 2017. Corporate uh, tax cuts, uh, which are permanent, but then individual tax cuts, which are not permanent. They expire at the end of 2025. Now that's two years away. That might seem like a long time uh, from now, but whoever is the next president, it's going to be the one who is signing whatever law Congress passes to figure out what to do about that. And I think it, it will be quite a stark difference between whether it's a Republican or a Democrat. Let's say Joe Biden wins re-election. I think that it, uh, and uh, uh, that he has a Democratic Congress. I think there's a good chance that tax cuts for everybody making more than four hundred thousand dollars are going to go back to where they were before 2017. So the, the top rate, as one example, got cut from 39.6 to 37 percent. I think that would go back up. But if uh, a Republican, Donald Trump, uh, or another president, uh, another Republican, then maybe a, a larger chance that those tax cuts remain in place. I mean, there are a lot of different ways it could go. Uh, but that is a big one coming up. Uh, and there's also the chance that if we have a Democrat, corporate tax rates could go up, could go back up. Rick, one other area that you're looking at is federal debt. You say federal debt is a key issue for investors. Why is that? Because it's now uh, a problem. Um, the, the debt crisis is arriving, and it's not a tidal wave. I mean, we're not seeing panic in the markets. It's more like uh, water is leaking through the foundation. Um, but we saw this uh, over the summer and the fall with 10-year um, uh, tre Treasury rates going up by about a uh, percentage point um, after the Federal Reserve finished raising interest rates. So that was some other reason. I mean, it's very hard to uh, suss out exactly why interest rates would be going up, but many uh, investors think it's just because there is so much debt coming out of the U.S. federal government um, and borrowing costs are going up. That debt is going to, uh, the, the deficits are going to stay over $1 trillion. This is really becoming a problem. Um, and it, it'd be nice to hear some presidential candidates say something about how to deal with this. So far, none of them has. And Rick, the outcome in the 2024 election could be pretty pivotal when you take into account the country's fight against or fight for, maybe in some instances, uh, green energy, fight against climate change. What does the potential outcome tell us about some of those initiatives? Uh, one of the biggest uh, bills President Biden signed into law was the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, ridiculous name, it had nothing to do with inflation, but it had uh, the most incentives for green energy production in American history. Um, so Republicans don't love that, and they've actually been trying to vilify electric vehicles uh, as some kind of um, less leftist publicity stunt. I think that's ridiculous. Um, electric vehicles are real and they're good and they have a place in the economy. But um, if Republicans come to power, they could try to do something to pull back some of those green energy incentives. Uh, and, and that's important because uh, companies are making big investment decisions today 
on the belief that those incentives will remain and that we're not going to have a new uh, president or a new administration that comes in and pulls the rug out from under them. And this is not just happening in blue states or blue districts. It's happening all across the country in red states as well as blue. Uh, so companies are making um, big long-term decisions based on those tax incentives being there for uh, a long time. So if we get a Republican who comes in and says, drill, 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 we're going back to fossil fuels, I want to repeal all those incentives, that would be a big problem for companies that are getting into this space. Rick, thanks so much for teeing this up for what we're going to have on our radar going into next year. Thanks so much. Bye, guys. See ya. Coming up, will 2024 bring more consolidation in the streaming space? We're taking a closer look next. Potential merger talks between Warner Brothers Discovery and Paramount first reported by Axios. Well, they have started to spark once again conversation around the future of streaming and if there is some appetite for consolidation. We want to bring in our next guest who says that mergers could be a near-term catalyst for some of the efficiency for cost cuts. For that, we want to bring in Mark DeBevoise. He is the CEO of Bright Cove. Mark, it's great to have you back here in studio. Let's talk about the report that we got out earlier this week from Axios. Reportedly there, Warner Brothers Discovery looking at Paramount, a deal there. Why that deal would make sense for Warner Brothers Discovery. Is there, is there a strong case for that? Yeah, look, I think these companies made tremendous efforts, like Herculean efforts to pivot and reshape their companies mm -hmm. for streaming. They did a tremendous job driving massive audience, right? 50, 60 million subscribers for each of their services. Tremendous, tremendous, you know, positive momentum. But there was tremendous, there was big costs that went with that, both in content and in infrastructure. And they're realizing now with the, the downturn in the traditional businesses of box office and cable, box office and cable, that they really are going to need to find ways to cut those costs. Oftentimes, you see a merger of size that is is able to really rip out costs faster mm -hmm. and really rapidly right size the size of those companies for those those changes that they had to make. So I think there's some rationale there for really getting those things together, finding ways to cut costs, and then maybe. There's a benefit for consumers by putting multiple services together. Do you get the right content mix that can really drive uh, more value for the customer, right? At the price points that they have, the worry you have though is sub overlap, right? How many subscribers does each service have that may be the same subscriber paying two times for two different things? And you have to really understand the depth between those two services to know if it's a good idea. In the deals that are potentially on the table for 2024, do you believe they're able to make that argument to regulators that prices for consumers will not go up? I 
think they can if they have the right you know map of those subscribers and the type of content they're going to keep. I think ultimately we know there was likely an overinvestment in content in the industry over a few years as they ramped towards this. So there's there's definitely content spend coming down. There's also infrastructure costs. Like one of the things my company does is really help you know lower those costs for large corporations in streaming. And I think they're all needing to look at those those costs and how they're going to be able to make them come down. If they can do that, I think they can hold that price. Uh, in a good way for consumers and make it really make, make sense. Are we just barreling towards a future of bundles? <clears throat> because, I mean, when you think about these types of acquisitions or the mergers that could take place here, it just seems like they're looking across the assets that each player has and saying, this is what we're missing out on, this would help solve that problem. Uh, look, I love the idea that, that the consumers are going to be able to choose their own bundles in the future because people have put together these services in a way that you can sort of mix and match as you go. I think that's the future of where it goes. But I think from an M&A perspective, what you'll see is not just consolidation where these companies come together, but potentially deconsolidation, right? A number of these assets probably should be reshaped to be more like to like, right? The cable assets go with cable, the box studios go with studios, the streamers go with streamers, instead of conglomerates that have sort of a bit of each as those businesses go up and down and have, you know, sort of traditional or sort of legacy decline and, and sort of modern, you know, growth businesses. Those being, being together may not make sense over the long run. So I think you're gonna see a lot of activity whether it's bundling, whether it's pieces of the companies coming in and out, I think you're going to see a lot of change over the next few years. Mark, how do you think media executives are thinking about those that still have the legacy side of the business, the more traditional cable companies? <clears throat> how are they walking that fine line of still trying to successfully run those businesses, many of them holding on to that as well, when you take a look at the recent comments from Bob Iger, while also investing in streaming? Is there a world where they're able to have both? Look, I think there are certain packages that do make sense mm -hmm. together, and I think you'll see that evolve over time. You know, those businesses are re relatively cash flow positive in, in today's day and age, and streaming, frankly, isn't yet, right, in most of these companies. They need to find a way to cut those costs, whether it's content, whether it's infrastructure, find a way to make that growth business profitable, while those businesses that are trailing off, flat, or shrinking, they're going to reap them for cash over time. So there is probably a right moment in which they they separate or, or they find a new way, but I think in many of these companies that will be a long moment from now. So I think it's going to be depending company by company, asset by asset, you know, where those things end up. If you think out to 2024 and there are three deals that you expect to happen, what would those three deals be? Uh, I, I would just say that there will be, my take is less on these big consolidations and more on these divestitures. I bet you will see a divestiture from every one of the major media companies of some asset in 2020. I mean, some of them are already teeing that up. You think about Disney and what they've already essentially communicated about ESPN. Yes, they communicate that and whether ESPN happens or not or what, you know, Paramount has communicated on BET previously that may happen or may not happen in the future. You've seen it come out of sort of each of them and you've seen you know, each of them realized that their portfolio, which was maximized maybe for a few years ago, may not be maximized for a streaming-centric future. So they have to think about how do they get to that point and really maximize the opportunity they have for the next 10 years, not the past 10. Mark, all this chatter about the death of cable, whether or not cable is going to be obsolete in 10 years, is some of that a bit exaggerated in terms of what is more realistic and what the media landscape is going to look like here within the next several years? Yeah, look, years? I liken it to, like, you still still have radio, you yeah. still have newspapers, right? I mean, businesses like these do not just go away into the ether, right? Mm -hmm. They they trend down and then they effect effectively flatten at some point. I do think the cable universe will flatten out at some point. And thinking of it as cable is probably the wrong moniker. It's a multi-channel bundle, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's sold via a traditional uh, a QAM, you know, cable access or it's sold through an IP delivery, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. So you look at YouTube TV, you look at Hulu Live, you look at Fubo, you look at some of these, you know, direct-to-consumer streaming versions of that bundle, I think those will survive over the long run at some tens of millions of subscribers. It's just not going to be the 95 or 100 million we had all those years ago. Yeah. All right, Mark, we got to leave things there on the day. We appreciate you joining us here in studio. No, thanks so much for having Thank me. You. Mark Debebois, who is the Bright Cove CEO. We've got all your markets action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
In the third quarter, stock buybacks across S&P 500 companies totaled more than $185 billion, up on a quarter-over-quarter -quarter basis, but far below 2022 levels this time last year. Companies will repurchase shares for a litany of reasons, really, but broadly buybacks reduce the number of outstanding shares listed, which has the ability to raise the value of the stock. So what does this quarter's data tell us about companies' outlook going into the new year? Howard Silverblatt, Senior Index Analyst over at S&P Dow Jones Indices, joins us now. Howard, great to speak with you and put some more context and insight around this. When you kind of compare 2023 to what we had seen even the year prior in 2022, where do we stack up more broadly on kind of a, a comp to average, perhaps, buyback basis? Well, well the buybacks have decreased from last year. Uh, companies are more concerned about their expenditures as well as the shares themselves have gone up in price a lot this year as compared to last year when they saw more bargain pricing, shall we say, with the market down so much. Uh, the net result here is that all buybacks are supporting stock. More buying coming in increases the bids going up, so it helps it. However, fewer companies are actually doing buybacks. We're seeing it top heavy. So the top 20 companies, the Apple, uh, Microsoft, they are accounting for a little bit over 50% of the buybacks. Uh, the other companies are kind of pulling back a little, more concerned about their cash flow. They are buying enough shares to re, uh, cover their option expense from employees, but they're not buying what's called discretionary shares. Those are more expensive. Those are ones that the company goes out, buys, puts in their treasury, reduces their EPS, and if they do enough of them, it increases their EPS that quarter. That's the main item that uh, shareholders are now looking at, and that uh, EPS impact to increase the EPS because you're reducing share count has declined for the fourth quarter in a row. Uh, and that's concerning at this point because you're not getting as much EPS support as you did in the prior years. So Howard, taking a look at the buyback activity that we saw during 2023 and looking ahead to 2024, how we are set up going into the new year, taking it into account where we saw the majority of some of that activity with some of those larger cap, uh, specifically within tech, larger cap tech names. What does that then tell us about expectations for the new year? I'm looking for about a nine and a half to ten percent increase in buybacks next year. This year we actually declined almost fifteen percent. But given that prices are high, they're, again they're not getting as many shares for their for their dollar uh, at this, so they're not reducing the EPS, the uh, share count for EPS. The bottom line here is that the impact of EPS. Uh, is not as great. Uh, easy example is for the third quarter, the full quarter, 13.5% uh, of the companies increased their earnings by at least 4%, a number we consider significant, uh, just by reducing their share count. Their dollar income didn't change, but 13.5% of them increased the EPS by at least 4%. That compares to a year ago when it was 21%. Uh, we're expecting that number to probably go down uh, next year in 2024 because prices are higher. Uh, not for everyone. I mean, it's definitely a sector situation at this point. We think financials uh, may be pulling back a little. There's new regulatories in there, so they uh, are protecting their dividends the way they did in 2022. Uh, we also see that IT will continue. Uh, the companies with strong cash flow that have it, they are definitely going to be continuing at this point, and we expect to see uh, strong buybacks with them, as well as the impact for the EPS. But the uh, rank and file, shall we say, in the uh, S&P 500, not as much so. So it's going to be selective based on your cash flow and products. How much of this is continuation of buybacks that were already announced versus going out into next year? new buybacks that you expect to come on the table and, and what among the parameters that you were mentioning a moment ago, companies with strong free cash flow that have the ability to kind of deploy some of those new buyback uh, or reshare repurchasing programs, which sectors seem most ripe for investors to, to think about as best positioned to announce some of those buyback plans? Yeah, the, the, the uh, announcements uh, we found typically do follow through and companies do what they're saying within a reasonable amount. But last year, not so as much as cash flow became an issue, even though stock prices were going up. And again, companies were getting less shares from the, for their dollar because prices were higher. Uh, so at th this point in time, cash flow does remain the main item 
uh, for selecting companies that you think are going to do the buybacks. The authorization is there, and we're seeing companies also use use the shares that they bought back uh, within energy, especially uh, we, we've seen companies, Exxon as a uh, prime example, you know, using their treasury shares that they've done buybacks for to do M&A. We think that will continue also. It's an easy way to uh, to purchase companies, uh, especially if the dilution is not too bad. But if you want to look for companies that are going to get the support, you need to look for the cash flow companies. And those are going to be crowded because there's a lot of funds out there and a lot of analysts now that are looking more at cash flow to support the stock. That means uh, that stock is going to be higher and you're going to be paying a premium for it. Howard, as we get ready to wrap up 2023, you have been involved in the market now for decades. I'm curious what your one piece of advice would be for investors as we look ahead to 2024, given the fact that there is so much uncertainty, whether or not we're talking about the fight against inflation, whether or not we're talking about Fed policy, the 2024 election, what should investors keep in mind? Well, on an individual basis, uh, we, we find that the most important item is to know your own tolerance, what you have, what you need your, your money for. It's things you look inward for. Do I need the money for retirement? Am I saving for college or uh, my, my kid's college or a house or something? Something that might force you to take action in the market at some point because I can't live through the, the next upturn, downturn time periods. So you have to know your longevity and your risk factor. As far as professionals go, knowing your risk factor and your exposure is key. Uh, and, and it always has been. Uncertainty is always going to be here. Instruments change. Uh, the ability to who's guiding the market also has changed significantly. When I started in uh, 1977, it was a, uh, a room of back uh, uh, of men smoking cigars and, and, and having scotch, excuse me for saying, in the back room, controlling the pension funds and everything. Today, individuals, we just saw from the Fed survey, 58% of people own stock, 21% of them directly. So individuals and sentiment play a big part in where the market is going. Name these guys, Howard. Who were they? Who was smoking cigars, <laughs> having scotch in the back room? Where is this back room? All right, questions we'll save and for not, later. And not anymore. Not and anymore. The bars downtown are empty. No moss. <laughs> <laughs> Howard Silverblatt, Senior Index Analyst over at S&P Dow Jones Indices. Thanks so much for taking the time here today. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, with just one more week left, one more week left in 2023, we're going to look ahead to some themes to watch in the new year. TD Cowan shared its top 10 themes for 2024, and we want to zone in on just a few key ones with Robert Fagan, who is the TD Cowan co-head of research. Robert, great to have you here with us this morning. Let's talk about artificial intelligence first and foremost. This was one that rounded out your top 10 list. It dominated conversations and the market in 2023. What should we be looking out for in that sector and theme in the new year? Yeah, I mean, certainly areas like cloud computing and search are the obvious uh, candidates, NVIDIA, Microsoft, Google, et cetera. But we've also looked at data center capacity, done a ton of work around that, as well as power consumption. Keep in mind that even the old generation of chat GPT, uh, which was GPT-3, uh, it took about eight times the amount of carbon footprint as the lifetime of a car. Uh, so an enormous amount of power consumption. We're also looking at other areas uh, in AI around the periphery, like drug discovery. It takes on average about 10 years and two and a half billion dollars to bring a new drug to market. So imagine if you could do that more accurately, more quickly uh, and help a whole lot more people. We take a look at some of your other themes. Another one that stuck out to us was geopolitical risk. We have certainly seen a rise in tensions around the world, too many to name at this point. In terms of the greatest risk or what investors need to keep in mind for how it could impact their portfolios, what's top of mind for you? Sure. I mean, certainly the, the flashpoints are Ukraine, the Middle East, Taiwan, et cetera. So the most obvious uh, impact of the theme is a rise in defense spending. In fact, we think that we could see an over 50% increase in defense spending in Europe over the next few years. I think it's important for investors to keep in mind that this won't be just uh, land and sea and air traditional investments, but we're seeing increasing investments in cybersecurity by the government, uh, space, which is a, a huge frontier uh, in terms of defense spending, as well as biosecurity. 
And then we got to talk about financials. I mean, we come across and come after this year that has been where you think about the banking crisis uh, for some of the regional banks and then the consolidation that took place thereafter. And now more recently, some of the considerations that large banks have had to make and appearances on Capitol Hill around Basel III in game. Where does this theme perhaps round out your list and, and what are some of the key catalysts that investors should be watching for? Yes, well, we certainly expect heavier uh, liquidity and capital requirements for banks. That seems almost certain. Um, and an area that we're watching carefully is commercial real estate, which is about 25% of bank loans and where a lot of the regionals are more exposed. If you look at CMBS delinquencies, for example, they rose to about 5.85% uh, recently, which is up from 1.5%, one percent 1.6% uh, last year. So uh, not an insignificant uh, increase in terms of CMBS delinquencies. And, and so commercial real estate, particularly office space, is, uh, is an area that we're watching carefully. When you take into account the 2024 election, the outcome, what that could mean more specifically for financials and some of these mega banks, what does that look like in terms of the regulatory landscape and the impact that that could then have on some of these fundamentals, on some of their returns? So the biggest wild card is, is of course, uh, President Trump. Uh, Trump is traditionally a low regulation, uh, viewed as a low regulation president, but at the same time, you've got all of the potential tariff issues uh, that we ran into uh, during his term as president. And so those are really the, the two major factors that uh, investors will be balancing. And then the, the final issue rounding things out is the implementation of the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, which was an extraordinarily impactful piece of legislation passed uh, in, in 2022 uh, that impacts everything from semiconductor spending, battery factory building, uh, pharmaceutical manufacturing, et cetera. So the next president will really have uh, a significant hand in how all of those dollars will be spent. Robert Fagan, thanks so much for taking the time to join us here this morning. D.D. Cowan's co-head of research. Thanks again. Happy holidays. Thank you. You too. Let's do a quick check of the markets here. As we uh, count down to a holiday shortened week, the last five trading days of the year right now, you're looking at gains across the board. The Dow up just above the flat line. The Nasdaq among the outperformers, along with the S&P here, up just about three-tenths of a percent. Where is Brendan? He was walking around the office. He's got this satin shirt know, that's red, and he's also got the, the Grinch jacket on. I love it. Wait, here, here he, he is. Comes. Come on, you got. we got to see the jacket the here today. at Yahoo Finance. Show, show him the, the red satin. The show red him the back. Satin. Ready? Turn around, bud. Oh, my gosh. Here we go. Naughty. Who oh, me? I yes. love that, bud. All right, special co-anchor <laughs> just for today, <laughs> yes. Brendan. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you, Brendan. Appreciate it. That's it for us today. Happy holidays, everyone.